Okay, cool. Uh, I'm very happy today uh, to welcome uh, Alessandro Farinelli, a full professor in computer science from the University of Verona. Uh, his research interests uh, uh, at least currently focus on uh, AI and uh, AI methods applied to robotics and cyber physical systems. He has been looking at multi-agent coordination and decentralized optimization, and this is a I would say a longer term interest as well, and also reinforcement learning data analysis for cyber physical systems, right? And he has developed several uh, innovative approaches for coordination of intelligent agents. And in the last few years, um, he has focused on development of approaches, RL based ones, right? Uh, applied to mobile robots, as well as uh, methods for situation awareness and anomaly detection. Uh, he has participated um, in several uh, national and international research projects. He has um, contributed to several of these. And one other cool thing that I noticed from his bio is like he has done this stuff of uh, smart robotic boats for water quality monitoring. I don't know if you will talk about that today. But uh, in general, um, it's a pleasure to have him here. I just realized that the last time we had him speak at IR Lab, if I'm not mistaken, was when I was a postdoc. I don't know if he has come here after that as a, a speaker. And that was several years ago right, uh, uh, at Birmingham. And uh, um, and also, whenever I think of Alessandro, the thing I remember, uh, he may or may not remember, is again, as a, uh, when I was a PhD student uh, playing, and I think he had finished his PhD at that point, uh, playing soccer at Darkstool. <laughs> For whatever reason, that's the image that comes to my mind. I don't know if he still plays soccer. So I will stop here and give it to Alessandro to take, uh, take us through this nice tour of reinforcement learning for intelligent robotic systems, challenges, and current trends. Sandro, up to you. Okay, thank you very much, Mohan, for the very nice introduction. I do remember the, the soccer game in Daxul <laughs> was a very interesting one. And, um, and I also remember the, the, the talk uh, that they gave when you were a postdoc and I was a postdoc as well at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a real pleasure to, to be invited again. Um, obviously, everyone hopes uh, this invitation will uh, be physical at some point, but for now, we will go ahead with the, with the virtual one. So as Mohan said, um, I've been working in general in AI applied to robotic system for a while. Most of the work I've been doing is actually focused on multi-agent, multi-robot uh, coordination. I will talk very um, a little bit about this, but this will not be the focus of the talk. I decided to focus the talk on uh, reinforcement learning and in particular on a specific perspective of reinforcement learning, which is related to safety and explainability, because this is the most recent work uh, we have been doing uh, uh, with, the, with, with the group that I'm collaborating with. And so I thought it would be more interesting to talk about newer stuff. So let's start with the overview. So the, um, I will uh, give uh, a very brief introduction to a couple of uh, interesting uh, application scenarios for uh, intelligent robotic system in general, in particular for mobile robots. And I will talk also about the environmental monitoring one, which is the, the one that Mohan was mentioning before. Then I will dive a little bit more into the technical part, which is reinforcement learning for intelligent robotic system and specifically focusing on safety guarantees for deep reinforcement learning. And then uh, let's say explainability, but more in particular identification of anomaly detection for uh, POMDPs and in particular for partially observable Monte Carlo plan, which is an approximate solution approach for POMDP. And then I will close with current uh, and uh, future research directions. And um, uh, I don't think we, we say that, but uh, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, uh, please do. You can interrupt during the talk. This would be nice and would make the talk uh, less formal and possibly more interesting. Okay, so to start, let's talk about the first application scenario that I would like to uh, discuss, which is the concept of using intelligent mobile robots for uh, application related to Industry uh, 4.0. Um, well, robotic systems have been used in industry for a while, uh, since the 70s, but in the last years, specifically from the years 2000s and, and on, uh, there has been a use of uh, mobile robots uh, as well. And more importantly, there is a, a clear trend that goes towards flexible operations in unstructured environments and also cooperating with humans. So for example, here in the left picture, you see the famous uh, uh, Amazon robotic system uh, that was developed by Kiva originally. And this has been uh, developed and in use more or less uh, from since 2000. Um, and this is a, a, um, a set of mobile robots that can transport pods in a large warehouse. 
Uh, then the trends of using uh, mobile robots for, uh, in these cases, uh, indoor logistics, but in general for Industry 4.0, uh, has developed towards having more flexible systems, such as, for example, the, the two robots, the two robotic platform that you see here. Uh, these are um, developed by Robotnik. They are called Kairos, and they are they fall within this uh, general uh, um, uh, category of collaborative mobile robots. And as you can see, they are a mobile platform with a manipulator on top, uh, and they are designed to be able to assist human in a shared workspace. So the moment you move uh, towards uh, a more flexible environment and cooperation with humans, of course, there are several uh, aspects that needs to be uh, taken into account that are, I would say, the core of AI, which is, of course, coordination, planning, particularly planning under uncertainty, and of course, reinforcement learning and learning in general. So there is a clear trend where reinforcement learning is uh, at the center of the of the picture and can be used uh, or um, has great potential to be used for uh, applications related to industry 4.0. Um, in particular, for this application scenario, we do have a research infrastructure in, the, in our university, which is called the Industrial Computer Engineering Lab. Uh, it's quite a large research infrastructure that has uh, several facilities. And in particular, it has a, a mini pallet transport line and several state of the art uh, um, machinery for uh, <clears throat> manufacturing in general. The interesting part for our talk is the uh, robot, um, the mobile robots um, that are these two Kairos platforms. But uh, the, I would like to uh, clarify that this is um, a quite large research lab that can be used to do experiments which are which can be done in an environment that is close to a, a real operation line. These are the, the robots that uh, we have access to and that we can use for the experiment and that we did use for some of the experiments that I will show. Um, I won't go into much of the detail of the different uh, um, capabilities. Essentially, it's a, a mobile platform that uh, uh, can also have uh, omnidirectional uh, movements because it has these uh, Swedish wheels. And then um, uh, a manipulator on top, uh, which is one from Universal Robotics. So this is a, a, just an example of uh, an application scenario that, um, that we uh, developed with the, these two mobile robots. And it's essentially fleet control for pickup and delivery tasks. Uh, so pickup and delivery has been a, a very important uh, application uh, uh, scenario for mobile robots, in particular for multi-agent and multi-robot system um, in the last years. And the idea is that robots need to go to a specific location, pick up an, uh, an item or more items, and then bring this to a, a given delivery location. Um, in this particular, I won't go into the detail of uh, the uh, algorithms that is behind these uh, uh, experiments, but essentially what we do here is that we guarantee that there are conflict-free paths uh, for environments which are quite challenging because they, they have cluttered space. And also robots can handle uh, unexpected events uh, by replanning the paths. Of course, coordination is the key point here. Um, as I said, I won't go into the detail of how the coordination algorithm is developed. If you have, if you, if you're interested into this, we can uh, discuss this uh, later on. So, When the movie starts, uh, you will see that this is uh, the uh, ICE laboratory. And uh, you can see that there are these two platforms. On the right, uh, you see the uh, topological map that the robots are, uh, um, are using to plan their paths. And essentially, here we have one pickup location and one delivery location. And the robots need to pick up, go to the pickup location. When an item is picked up, then they will plan a path to reach the delivery location and then go back home. One interesting thing is that, uh, uh, as you probably noticed, uh, uh, an object has been placed uh, in the center of the environment, and this uh, is uh, essentially blocking one possible path for the robot. And so now, as you probably noticed, the robots um, performed uh, quite a complex coordinated movement uh, where the red robot moved away uh, to, let, to let the blue robot pass, and then they go back to their uh, final uh, uh, destination, to their home destination. So this is just uh, to give you a, an idea of um, uh, what we mean when we uh, consider logistic operation with mobile robots. In particular, the interesting aspect of this application is the fact 
that the environment is not uh, engineered for the robot. The environment is quite small with respect to the, to the robot. And so the robot needs to coordinate their action uh, with a sophisticated uh, algorithm to make sure that they will find the conflict free paths. Then moving on to the second uh, interesting environment for uh, uh, AI in general, reinforcement learning in particular, this is the water monitoring application that we mentioned uh, at the beginning. And this was uh, uh, developed during a, within the framework of a EU project called INCATCH. The general idea is that uh, water is considered as a natural capital and so it needs significant effort to ensure that uh, its quality stays high or gets better and uh, when this project started it was 2016 um, the european water bodies were not achieving uh, their environmental objectives mainly because the uh, program that were uh, enforced to monitor and and then um, apply intervention were based mainly on uh, um, lab tests that were performed uh, on a, a given uh, time scale and on specific locations. And so essentially what the environmental agency were getting uh, were uh, a lot of data, but very few information. And also the digital infrastructure was not used uh, enough to uh, empower the monitoring uh, aspects of the for, for the for the water monitoring part. And so the idea of the project was to have uh, um, an integrated approach to make the digital part of uh, monitoring more uh, apparent and use innovative tools uh, to essentially gather less data, so reduce cost, but provide more information. This was essentially the idea. So this has been done with this project uh, that was uh, um, performed by about 20 partners. So it was quite a large project. It was an innovative actions. And uh, the main building block of the project, uh, it was an interdisciplinary project uh, and it was actually under the water pillar. Um, so there, there were significant parts of the project that are not deeply related to AI or, uh, or robotics, such as, for example, uh, water treatment plants, such as this CSO that stands for Combined Sewage Overflow. While there are other aspects that were deeply related to uh, uh, ICT in general, so the decision support system, the drones, that is the main part that we developed, um, a cloud-based uh, water archival information system, and then the sensors for actually providing information about the waters, about the water. This is a, a video that shows uh, um, the drones that we developed during the project. So this was our main task within the project. And these drones, as you can see, they are very small. They are about one meter uh, for 50 centimeter, one meter length, 50 centimeter wide. They have sensors underneath the hull, and these sensors can provide the information uh, via wireless connection and also 3G. The robots are geolocalized, so you can have, uh, um, essentially you can build a map where you see the data overlaid on the map, as you can uh, uh, see in this picture. And also, as you can see, this, uh, uh, the robots can be controlled with mobile devices. In this case, uh, it's a tablet, but it can be also a phone. And they have uh, uh, a high level of autonomy. In particular, they can plan their path uh, and they can follow the path based on GPS localization. So the reason why there was a strong effort to have uh, uh, the AI component and also the possibility of uh, using them with the mobile device is that an important part of the project was to make this uh, tool usable uh, by people that are not experts in, in, uh, in robotics, but water experts, okay? So, and maybe even non-governative organization that are eager to perform monitoring, but they don't have the tool uh, to actually perform the monitoring. So this was the, the general idea of the project. And uh, one inter very interesting aspect that uh, uh, I've seen while uh, developing the project is that uh, uh, really what, um, people that were actually doing the water monitoring uh, were interested in was to have uh, essentially a radio controlled robot. Uh, this was the main modality of use of the robot. But during the course of the project, people started to understand the value of autonomy, which, of course, being uh, an AI person, I gave for granted from the beginning. But it was not so obvious to them. But while you developing the project, there has been several aspects that came into the picture that showed that actually autonomy was a big advantage. 
One main one, of course, is the fact that you can operate beyond the line of sight. So, for example, this is um, a development um, deployment that we did in Spain, in the River Ter. And as you can see here, the drone is uh, hardly visible. So it's quite far because most of the time you don't have a direct access to the water. So it's important to, that the robot is able to survive, so to say, and do some uh, um, to move and navigate in the environment in autonomy without a direct line of sight with the operator. There are more subtle reasons why autonomy is important in this uh, particular application. One is the fact that you can actually perform repeatable measurements over time. And this is, for example, what you, the picture that you see here uh, is actually um, uh, a, measure, a set, series of measurements that we performed in a, in a lake. And we planned the path for the robot offline and we saved the data. So you can reuse exactly the same GPS location to plan a path in a different day. And you are sure, given GPS position accuracy, that the robot will actually perform the same path so that you can actually uh, see how the value of the parameters that you're measuring, in this case, we are looking at the temperature of the water, uh, changes over time. Another point, which is quite interesting, is the possibility of ensuring data quality uh, by enforcing uh, behaviors to the robot. A very simple example is that some of these uh, sensors uh, require a significant amount of time to stabilize uh, the, the reading for the data. So if the boat goes faster than a given amount, you are actually reading information, reading data that are not valuable. So if you can uh, provide an autonomous behavior that is already designed to provide clean data, you then reduce the effort of post-processing and you have higher quality data uh, that uh, are given from the system. The use of this drone has been uh, actually one of the most uh, of the most uh, interesting outcome of the project uh, is the fact that the drone has been used uh, quite a lot uh, during the project. So we performed more than 250 data collecting missions. And also a very interesting part is that uh, um, less than a half of these, uh, actually only 50, has been performed by the people that actually developed the drone. So a lot of this uh, uh, data collection mission has actually been performed by people that were not robotics experts or AI experts. And this, of course, is very challenging. Uh, what you can see here, I think uh, an interesting uh, uh, picture is the, this one on the right, where you can see um, this, in this case, EC is uh, electroconductivity of the water. And what you can see is that along this river, uh, before a given point, there is a low value of electroconductivity. After a given point, there is a higher value. And in fact, in this point, there is a sugar bean factory. And that was actually uh, disposing water inside the, the, the river. And so this shows that actually these kind of tools can be used to um, uh, identify point pollution. This is how they are caused, uh, called. And, and this was one of the objectives of the project. This, uh, uh, all the data can be actually um, accessed uh, at this uh, link that you see here, if you're interested. And also an interesting thing is that these kind of uh, platforms are also are still in use after the project has uh, ended because uh, some of the partners, in particular in Greece, uh, in, uh, they are using it uh, and they are trying to commercialize uh, these kind of platforms for uh, uh, water um, companies and environment protection agencies in general. So why I described these uh, two applications where one thing is that I think they're very interesting application in general, but the reason why I decided to give you a brief overview in this talk is because I think that uh, AI in general, but reinforcement learning in particular can have a big role in, in these two kind of uh, applications, in particular, for example, for the water uh, monitoring. Um, in the movie that I showed you, you have seen the boat moving uh, in a lake that was actually Lake Garda, which is quite a big lake in Italy, and uh, is much more similar to a sea for what concerns the dynamic of the water with respect to a, a flat lake. And But also you can imagine on a river, if you have currents, obviously the environment is not stationary. And so um, designing a good controller for the, for the robot is quite challenging. Also considering that the robot um, uh, configuration can change because you can, for example, add a sensor that can impose a weight on some part of the uh, platform with respect to other parts. And this, of course, would change the, um, 
attitude of the platform on the water and so it will of course change the way it moves so having a more um, um at a low level having um uh, adaptive behavior uh, that can drive the robot uh, learning how the robot moves in the environment is very valuable at a higher level of course having uh, um planning under uncertainty framework is very useful to decide uh, for example where to sample based on the current environment situation or based on the data that have been acquired so these are all things that are, that are not uh, the standard use of these tools at the moment and can be i think that where ai can have a, a huge impact okay so this uh, concludes the part for the application scenarios these scenarios will be um, uh, we will see them uh, during the talk and, and now we go a little bit more into the detail of the reinforcement learning uh, uh, approaches for uh, uh, intelligent robotic system. Of course, reinforcement learning uh, is a huge uh, field, so there are many techniques, uh, many aspects. Uh, I will focus on two of uh, what I consider the most interesting aspects of uh, reinforcement learning when you want to apply this to intelligent robotic system, which relates to safety and then to identification of a um anomaly behaviors okay so um i will not go into uh, a description of what reinforcement learning is um i think this should be given for granted uh, but the the two aspects that we will consider are based on two main uh, um line so to say a research line one is related to POMCP, uh, which stands for Partially Observable Monte Carlo Planning. And this is um, a, an approximate algorithm for, for uh, solving a large partially observable Markov decision process. Uh, so it's a planning under uncertainty uh, uh, approach. And this was, has been proposed for the first time uh, around 2010. It's uh, very powerful because it can uh, uh, solve uh, uh, large scale POMDPs, which are very difficult uh, to solve, of course, uh, in, in an approximate fashion, um, and uh, is belongs to the model-based, uh, um, let's say, category of uh, reinforcement learning, because it requires a, a simulator that is essentially your model. It's based on Monte Carlo research, and the key point is that, uh, as we will see later on, it's uh, very powerful, but it's quite difficult to analyze. So it's important to have uh, uh, tools that can uh tell you whether there are strange behavior of the robot and possibly give you a um a possible cause of the behavior of the strange behavior the other part uh, will be related to deep reinforcement learning and uh, this will be more related to safety for deep reinforcement learning uh well deep reinforcement learning is a very hot topic now in the research community and also in uh, in industry uh, in companies um Probably the most uh, well-known paper that uh, uh, started the, 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 the big interest in deep reinforcement learning is the paper uh, apply, um, that appeared in Nature in 2015, uh, where res this researcher, they developed uh, a system that can, artificial system based on deep reinforcement learning, in particular is DeepQN, that can reach human level ability in uh, Atari games. The important thing is that this is uh, possible by using the same input and output that a human would use. So the screen and then the joystick as an output. Uh, uh, Sandro, do you mind if I yes. interrupt with just one question? Yeah, no, please. Uh, so uh, are you are you for the for this talk? Are you going to be focusing on model free methods or model based methods? I will uh, say something about both. Uh, oh, okay. So the, in the first part, uh, we, I will uh, discuss more the deeper reinforcement learning side, uh, but mm -hmm. focusing more on the, on the safety aspect. In the second part, uh, we will see the POMCP, but just as a tool uh, that we will try to analyze. Okay. Okay. And will the model matter? I mean, will you be looking at policies or the models also? Just, I mean, just to sort of mentally place this. Yeah. So. No, 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 that we will, we will not. Uh, we are doing some work uh, along that line, but uh, for this talk, we will give the model, uh, uh, when we talk about model days, we will give the model as granted. So you do have- Okay. This thank you. No, this, uh, this is very helpful for me to mentally. Yeah. Thank you. Go on. Sorry. Go on. No problem. Okay. <laughs> so, 
We start with the uh, deep reinforcement learning for robotics. And uh, of course, deep reinforcement learning has been used, uh, as I said, uh, quite, quite uh, a lot from 2015 onwards. I would say mostly in uh, games and video games environments. Um, and uh, the tools that have been developed uh, range from uh, um, discrete uh, action, uh, well, discrete value-based tools, such as, for example, DeepQ Network. And then moving on, uh, there has been a strong interest toward policy-based uh, continuous approaches, such as, for example, Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient or Proximal Policy Optimization, which is an improved version. Um, uh, it's arguable, but we may say that proximal policy optimization is the, uh, at the moment, the, the main baseline uh, with which most of the deep reinforcement learning approaches are compared. Um, and uh, for what concern robotics, uh, an interesting application uh, scenario for uh, deep reinforcement learning is mapless navigation, where essentially you want to drive your robot to a given goal location where the robot uh, can perceive obstacles, but does not have uh, um, a map of the environment and is not building a map of the environment. It's just trying to reach the goal, avoiding obstacles based on sensor information. So what you see here on the left is an example of uh, um, a turtle bot uh, performing mapless navigation on an indoor scenario, while on the right, uh, you can see the in-catch drone and uh, in particular, you can see here a simulator that um, uh, we, we built. <clears throat> this is actually a work mainly developed by uh, Enrico Marchesini, which is also with us today, uh, a PhD working with me. And uh, this uh, environment has been developed uh, in, uh, in the Unity game engine, and it turns out to be a very useful environment if you want to do uh, fast uh, training for mapless navigation in the context of uh, uh, water drones. Uh, sorry, Sandro, one more question. I shouldn't have started. Is it okay? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. so, so how does it know where to go? I mean, um, if it's completely mapless, does it have some coordinates? Where, is it just random exploration? Yeah, so it's a, no, it's not random exploration. Uh, you have, uh, essentially, you know the direction and the distance from the target. Ah, okay, thank you. It's not clear how you, yeah. how you have it. It depends on the application, but this is mm -hmm. the input to your, to your system. I see, but no, no notion of where there are, and it doesn't build any map on the way either. Exactly, exactly. It okay. doesn't have the map. It can perceive the obstacle with the uh, with the standard sensors, typically a leader, but it does not build the map. Okay, and thank it you. Does not for navigation. So that that's the term mapless navigation. Okay. Um, okay. So. What are the main challenges when you try to actually apply deep reinforcement learning to robotics? As I said before, most of the applications that uh, uh, have been very successful for deep reinforcement learning uh, are still not uh, at a commercial level, at least in, uh, in robotics, for sure. And the reason is that there are several challenges for applying deep reinforcement learning to robotics, well, reinforcement learning in general, but deep reinforcement learning in particular. The first one is that, of course, a successful deep reinforcement learning application needs to be trained uh, so that the agent needs to be trained in the environment, in the, in the operational environment. And for robotics, this is obviously very difficult, uh, challenging and sometimes dangerous. So, for example, consider the example of uh, the uh, water drone. It would be very challenging to actually put the drone into the water and start training uh, without uh, a predefined policy for the agent. So the typical approach that people use is to train in a synthetic environment and then move after the network has been trained, move to the robotic platform, maybe testing before validating, so to say, in a more uh, refined simulator. This approach seems to work quite well. Of course, it's not solving completely the issue. There is a, what is typically called seem to real issue because of course your simulator uh, cannot capture all the aspects of the reality. But this is a, um, a typical approach that is used for deep reinforcement learning. In particular, as I mentioned before, uh, one thing that we find uh, useful to um, develop deep reinforcement learning applications is to use Unity as a simulator that is uh, to, in the training phase because it's extremely fast. And then we uh, export uh, essentially the network on the, uh, on, the, on the robotics application. In particular, we typically use ROS. And so we do validation in Gazebo, and then we do the test on the real robots. So this is the, the usual pipeline for developing a deep reinforcement learning application. 
The second point that is very challenging is that uh, training typically requires significant computational resources. Um, this is particularly true if you go with uh, continuous approaches, for example. So there are different ways in which you can approach this. Uh, it's not a solved issue. Uh, we uh, provided a couple of contribution in this space. Uh, again, this is mainly the work of Enrico. Um, in one first uh, paper that has been published uh, at ICRA in 2020, uh, we uh, propose uh, actually a discretized approach and uh, optimization approaches for the deep reinforcement learning. And, and we show that this actually significantly reduced training time. Another, another interesting uh, research line is the combination of gradient-free and gradient-based method. So gradient-free are essentially evolutionary strategies, such as, for example, uh, genetic algorithms. If you combine them with uh, gradient-based methods, typically you have a more stable and faster uh, convergence to a high reward for deep in, in deep reinforcement learning application. And if you're interested in into this, uh, this is uh, another uh, paper that was uh, recently accepted at ICLR. Again, the main uh, uh, author here is uh, Enrico and uh, it, it was developed also together with Davide. I will not go into more detail on the optimization of the deep reinforcement learning uh, approaches, because I think that probably one of the most interesting uh, aspects of deep reinforcement learning and one of the main stopping criteria for using it in realistic application is relates to safety. So essentially, before you deploy the system, you, you want to make sure that it actually uh, works significantly well in the environment and to, to avoid, of course, bad states or dangerous situations. And but this is very difficult, of course, for uh, deep reinforcement learning. It's a, a, a known issue, one of the main issues for machine learning in general, deep reinforcement learning in particular. Um, there are mainly two lines that you can see in the, in the literature. One is that you try to avoid undesirable states during the training. So you want to avoid that the agent will actually visit uh, states that you consider dangerous or undesirable. And there are different approaches to do this. So this is typically called safe reinforcement learning. You can use uh, reward shaping. So carefully uh, design the reward uh, to, to avoid these dangerous states. A very interesting uh, framework that uh, recently has been researched quite a lot is the one typically refer to constrained Markov decision process or constrained uh, RL, which is essentially you have uh, um, a reward function that you try to optimize, but you also have a cost function that uh, uh, penalizes the uh, when you're visiting uh, these bad states. What you see here on the right is an image of the safety gym uh, environment. And uh, for example, in this case, uh, the robot, which is this uh, red uh, um, car-like uh, robot, uh, should reach uh, the, the different uh, yellow points, but uh, it should uh, avoid the blue circles. One important thing is that the blue circles don't uh, affect the reward. It only affect, uh, they only affect the, the safety part, so only the cost. While, for example, the purple uh, cubes, uh, they are perceived by the robot and they can be avoided. But the robot uh, knows where these blue circles are, but the reward is not directly affected by that. So that's why it's, it's essentially a multi-objective optimization. What uh, we will be looking at is a different uh, um, uh, approach, which is the one of evaluating a trained neural network, which is also quite uh, interesting and challenging because typically when you have uh, a trained neural network, uh, trained with some of the approaches that we've seen before, it's still very difficult to state whether the neural network is ready to be deployed. Typically, what people do is uh, relying on extensive testing. So you do a lot of tests in the simulation environment, maybe several tests on the real env environment, and then you deem the network to be ready to be used. But there is a, a, a key point uh, behind this uh, that is, I think, very well depicted here on this uh, picture. So this is a um, quite famous uh, application, uh, let's say, toy problem for reinforcement learning, which is the cart pool, uh, where you have this uh, black cart that can move left and right and should balance the pool uh, without uh, having the pool fall down. <clears throat> so this is a, a standard uh, application for uh, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. And what you can see here on the right is uh, the state distribution of a, a train network. So the state here is the pole velocity and the angle of the pole. 
This is the state distribution that you can uh, you can see after a high number of episodes, ten thousands in particular. While on the right, you can see the blue dots uh, represent input configuration that cause a wrong decision for the robot. Where here a wrong decision is, for example, the fact that the pole is falling towards the left, but the robot decides to go right instead of trying to balance. So it takes a wrong decision. So what you can see here, it's pretty clear that. Uh, there is a, a misalignment between the states that you visit during testing and the states that actually cause a violation. So you can see that most of the states that cause violations are placed in a part of the input configuration that is actually not visited or not visited often by the testing part. So this means that essentially the network will not work properly if you encounter one of these states, and there are many of these states that has not been encountered during the testing. Okay, so this is the typical problem of uh, uh, verification, but this in particular for neural network, of course, poses some extra challenges because doing verification on neural network is actually very difficult. So this is what we focus on. Can we try to provide guarantees on the fact that a network will not, uh, uh, let's say a deep reinforcement uh, uh, learning agent, Will, need, will not violate some properties that we consider important and we typically call safety properties. Okay, so this is to go a little bit more in detail. This is uh, um, what is uh, typically uh, called the formal verification for artificial neural networks. So this uh, notice that in general, we are talking about artificial neural networks, not necessarily for uh, deep reinforcement learning. And uh, one element is that to, to do this uh, is to have uh, a proper specification of these safety properties. So typically these safety properties have this form and our goal is to verify that a set of safety properties are valid for every possible configuration of the input space. So what you see here is that uh, the property have this form. So if uh, the left part holds, the right part should hold and the left part is essentially a definition of um, uh, interval, okay, bounds for the input. So x0 is uh, one input for the network, xn is uh, the last input for the network, and you specify some bounds. And what you require is to make sure that if the input configuration is within these bounds, then the, in particular in this case, one output of the network is within a given bound. This is uh, the formal, the, the property that you try to verify with formal verification. Verification for neural network is a hard problem for several reasons. The most important ones is that you actually deal typically with nonlinear activation functions. You have an issue of scalability. This will be clearer later why scalability is, uh, is an issue here. And also, as we will see, it's very difficult to define properly safety properties that actually are aligned with the goal that you want to achieve. This is a very short uh, uh, state of the art for what concerns formal verification for artificial neural network. Uh, essentially, as you can see, these works are all uh, quite recent. Um, and you, if you uh, look at the, um, at the brief description, you can see that they are divided between uh, optimization methods, such as, for example, uh, Reluplex, which is this method developed in 2017, or reachability analysis, such as, for example, Neurify, which is the method uh, written here, Wang 2018. We also focus uh, on reachability approaches, so we are closer to, to this approach here. And uh, in this slide, I will try to explain um, a little bit what, what is the issue that you uh, face when you go from standard verification of artificial neural networks to verification for decision-making neural networks for typically for uh, deep reinforcement learning. So as we've seen, if you consider property uh, definition for artificial neural network, typically they have this form, okay, where you have bounds on the input configuration and a bound on the output configuration. If we care about behavioral properties, so you care about a decision that the network is taking, so for example, a robot needs to decide whether to go left or right, Typically, when you do deep reinforcement learning, the output of the network has several possible actions, and the one that has the highest activation level is the one selected by the approach. So what you care in this case are relationship between the output. 
and not static bounds. So for example, in this case, what you are saying is uh, if the configuration is within a given bound, then the output, uh, the J output should always be higher than the Y output. For example, is if an obstacle is close to the left, the robot should never turn left. Okay, should decide to turn to go straight or turn right, but it should never turn left. Okay, so something like this. So why this is uh, important? Uh, because this picture that you see here on the on the um, on the left shows an example where you define for a given configuration for an input configuration a bound on the on the output. So imagine that on the x axis you have all the possible configuration, on the y axis you have the bound that is defined by your uh, property verification. So what you can see here is that uh, in this case uh, y zero you you can identify this bound, okay. But if you care about two outputs, Y0 and Y1, you can see that in this particular situation, Y0 is always higher than Y1 in the input space that you are considering. But if you consider the bound for Y0 and the bound for Y1, they actually overlap. So you cannot conclude, you cannot guarantee, if you look at the whole configuration, okay, that Y0 is always higher than Y1, if you look at the bounds. What people typically do is to divide the input configuration into smaller areas so that you have a better bounds, okay? tighter bounds in particular. If you do this, in this example, what you can see is that if you actually subdivide the input configuration and do a reachability analysis for each of the sub areas, Y0 is actually always higher than Y1, even if you look at the, all the different bounds. Okay, while well, you cannot conclude that Y1 is uh, always higher or lower than Y2, but okay, this is correct. But crucially, in this case, if you subdivide the input configuration, you can conclude, guarantee that Y0 is always higher than Y1. So that's where the scalability issue comes into play because you need to do a reachability analysis for a several subset of uh, input uh, configurations, several areas. And so you, typical approaches that so for example, Neurify that works quite well for uh, standard uh, artificial neural networks, they don't work so well, they don't scale when you consider behavioral properties. So with respect to this, uh, our main contribution uh, in this field is to um, uh, propose uh, this uh, method called Prove Property Verifier that evaluates whether a behavioral property holds for a trained neural network. This is based on iterative recursive splitting of the input area, which is this process that I described before. And this is a joint work, uh, again, with Davide Corsi and Enrico Marchesini, where Davide Corsi, in this case, is the, is the main author. Um, and this, uh, the, what I will describe here, has been actually uh, recently accepted at uh, the conference UAI, uh, Uncertainty in Artificial Intelligence. So, uh, essentially, the main contribution is to encode the recursive splitting procedure as a matrix multiplication task, because this is then makes uh, um, this uh, approach much faster to the, the verification approach much faster. In fact, it is up to um, 56 times faster than Neurify on some uh, given task. Then we define what we call a violation rate, which is essentially a percentage of input area that causes a violation. This is interesting because it goes beyond uh, saying uh, um, this property is verified or not verified because it can tell, can give you an idea on how many input configurations, well, what is the uh, size of the area of the input configuration that actually causes a violation. Okay, so it gives you more information on how well the model is, uh, has been trained for what concerns safety. <clears throat> and then we also showed that this method, method can actually be used to evaluate uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning agent for real world decision making tasks, in particular mapless navigation and trajectory generation for robotic manipulator. I will not go into the detail of the, of the, of the methods. If you're interested, uh, you can contact me and, uh, and we can discuss this more in detail. But I would like to highlight some of the key results that we, we saw. So in particular here, what you see is the um, uh, two, um, let's say, standard uh, graphs that you do when you try to evaluate deep reinforcement learning approaches, where on the x-axis you have the training episodes, and on the y-axis you have a percentage of the safe rate 
and the success rate. So the success rate is the mean measure of performance. It's telling you in this particular case, how many times the robotic ma manipulator uh, reached the uh, end point uh, correctly. Okay, while the safe rate is the opposite of the violation rate. Okay, so if it's 100, it means that no input configuration violates safety properties, and, and then it's a percentage of this. Uh, what you can see here for both, actually, uh, with different uh, shape, but for both uh, these tasks, so robotic manipulation and then mapless navigation, what you can see here is that uh, at the beginning, uh, the safety is quite high. Okay, uh, in particular for robotic manipulation. Why? Essentially because uh, the robot is, is uh, moving very little, so it's not causing violations to safety properties. In this case, safety properties are related to the fact that the robot, the, every joint of the robot should not go outside a given bound. But then when the uh, success rate begins to uh, grow, you can have uh, this uh, valley Okay, for the violation rate, and this typically starts towards the end of the of the of the training, because typically towards the end, the, the uh, deeper reinforcement learning agent starts to be more efficient. It op optimizes uh, more the uh, reward, and this can cause safety property to be violated. This is very clear in mapless navigation. Essentially, the concept is that when you have a higher success rate. Uh, towards the end, the robot starts to go closer to the obstacles to uh, make a faster, to a um, uh, shorter path, but this, of course, can cause a violation to safety. Okay, so this is interesting because it shows that uh, it's difficult to optimize the performance and safety at the same time, and it's also difficult to decide when to stop the training uh, if, you can, if you care also about the um, uh, safety properties. This is also uh, the, the last uh, results for what concerns this part of the talk. This is a uh, results that we achieve, we um, uh, obtain in the ACAS uh, dataset. So this is a, um, a dataset for uh, um, airplane, so avoiding collision in airplanes. <clears throat> and what you can see here in this table, uh, we have the several models. So each of these models um, has been um, uh, trained and all of these models have uh, a similar uh, reward, but they have different violation rates. The violation rate has been considered with respect to two general properties that we defined, that we call theta L and theta R. And these are very high level properties that says that if there is an intruder close to the left, never turn left. An intruder in this case is another airplane that you can crash uh, with. So, or if there is an intruder close to the right, never turn right. So these are very high level properties, but as you can see, there is a correlation between the violation rate that we can measure with proof and the collision that actually happens in the environment for the same model, okay? So you have a model, for example, in this case, uh, uh, ACAS 50, the violation rate is about 50%, and you have a high collision rate. Collision rate has been obtained by a given safety critical configuration that has been defined in previous work. So there is a high correlation, and you can also see that uh, it's very difficult to reduce to zero the violation rate. The interesting outcome is that if you consider instead of these safety properties, the safety properties that has been defined in the original paper of the ACAS dataset, which are much more Special, specialized property, okay? So they're not so general. They are, uh, they described much more in detail the configuration space, and they are 15 properties. You can actually reach zero rate of violation, but this doesn't mean that you don't get collisions, okay? So there is a gap between, uh, so even if you can uh, completely verify your properties, it doesn't mean that your property correctly describe the safety um, goal that you have in mind. So for example, in this case, a model that correctly verify all the properties defined in the original ACAS uh, paper still can have some collisions, okay? So this means essentially two things. The first thing is that high level behavioral property are more informative for the evaluations rather than very specific properties. The second thing, which is probably more interesting, is that writing safety properties is actually difficult. And is one of the main issue if you actually want to uh, uh, enforce safety for deep reinforcement learning. 
Okay, so this is uh, uh, the more or less the um, description of uh, safety related to deep reinforcement learning. And then we can move on to the identification of uh, uh, anomaly behavior for POMCP. So in, in case you have questions on the first part, uh, maybe this is a good time to ask. Otherwise, we, I, I move on and then we can, we, we can discuss at the, at, the, at the end of the talk. Okay. So in this, uh, uh, in this, in this second part, uh, we focus on a slightly different aspect, which is uh, planning under uncertainty. And in particular, high-level control using uh, this uh, uh, approach called POMCP, Partially Observable Monte Carlo Planning, which, as I briefly mentioned before, is a powerful approximation algorithm for solving partially observable Markov decision process. The approach is based on Monte Carlo research, which, as you probably know, is um, an advanced uh, uh, tree search uh, procedure. Uh, which essentially is unbalanced and tries to move uh, the search towards area that have uh, higher uh, uh, probabilities of getting higher reward. But, but it does this in the context of uh, uh, partially observable Monte um, Markov decision processes. So essentially, the search is performed uh, in a in a belief space. Okay, and what you uh, what you have in the in the search tree is actually a sequence of action observation, action, and observation. One of the most important uh, aspects of uh, POMCP is the fact that this is uh, online. So this means that the policy is never stored. The policy is the mapping, in case of POMDP, between belief and action. And the fact that this is never stored is important because, because storing a policy for a large POMDP is an issue. It won't fit in memory. And in any case, it will, it will take uh, a very long time to list uh, all the possible uh, beliefs that you can have. So <clears throat> the policy is never stored. This is, of course, very good for scalability, but it means that it's very difficult to analyze uh, what, the, what actually the, the robot uh, is doing and why it took an action rather than another one. This video that you see here is uh, um, just to show that uh, this kind of approach can be uh, used on uh, mobile robots. And what you can see here is um, an example that we will see a little bit more in detail later on, which is called velocity regulation. So these robots, have, they have a pre-planned path, which is this rectangle that you see here. And each segment of this path has a, difficult, has a different difficulty, which is essentially how cluttered is the segment uh, for navigation. And the goal for the robot is to perform the whole path, regulating the velocity, uh, going slow when the, when the difficulty is high, and going fast when the difficulty is low. The difficulty is not directly observable uh, by the robot, so that's why it's a POMDP. <clears throat> and what you can see here is that the robots are uh, performing the path, and uh, these are different uh, on the column. You have different type of POMCP. The first one is uh, an oracle in the sense that it actually has access to the difficulty. So it's, of course, it will perform the best. Uh, the second one is the standard POMCP. The third one is uh, an application uh, we developed together with uh, Alberto Castellini in this case. Uh, it's an extended POMCP that uh, encodes the previous knowledge on the, on the on the environment using a Markov random field. In particular here, the um, previous knowledge is related to the similarity of the difficulty between the different segments. So what you know is that the segment on top has the same difficulty on the segment on the bottom. You don't know this difficulty, but you know that they have a similar uh, difficulty encoded with a Markov random field. Okay, I will not go into the detail of this, but uh, this was just to give you a visualization of what this uh, velocity regulation problem is uh, and uh, to show that you can actually use uh, POMCP to drive uh, a mobile robots and take decisions uh, during mission execution. The real focus of, uh, of this part is actually on uh, devising uh, a method to make POMCP more explainable, uh, in particular a methodology to analyze uh, POMCP policies. As we discussed before, policies are never directly uh, represented in POMCP. So this means that uh, you, you need somehow to encode these policies in some way. Okay, so this is the general idea. 
This is a joint work with uh, Giulio Mazzi, that is also present uh, with us today, and Alberto Castellini. Uh, and this was uh, a paper accepted at AMAS in 2021, so this year. Uh, this is a, an overview of what we propose. Essentially, the idea is that you have a POMCP agent that uh, uh, execute based on a, on a given model. It performs uh, action selection and it actually acts in the real environment. So you have traces of real executions. And then you have an expert that provides high level insight that we encode with what we call the rule template. This rule template are used to analyze the traces to actually synthesize rule. And for doing this, we actually use the SMT based approach. So satisfiability module theory. Why? Because the rule templates are, are uh, encoded using first order logics. So when these uh, rules are then synthesized, you can use the rules to the rule, uh, the synthesized rule to analyze the traces and check if there are outliers on the decision of the robot. So if some of the action that the robot took are far from what you expect based on the expert insight. Okay, then based on this uh, outlier analysis and on the rule, okay, you can actually have a feedback uh, to the expert because for unexpected decision that actually violate the insight that the expert is proposing, uh, you can provide a feedback and the expert can refine the rule template if required. So essentially, in short, what we do is we encode the expert inside in a formal, um, uh, formal language. We analyze the execution traces and then we build rules and identify the unexpected decisions. This is what the, the main contributions. This is a visualization of velocity regulation, uh, which is a running example. And um, essentially, just to uh, clarify a bit better, we have segments. Uh, so for example, uh, segment uh, eight here is the whole segment that uh, goes across the top. And this segment in div is divided into uh, different sub-segments, but the sub-segments share the same difficulty of the segment. Then the robot needs to decide which velocity to take in each of these uh, sub-segments, and the difficulty is not directly observable. The action is the speed and the probability of collision depends on speed and difficulty. So if you go fast on a segment that is difficult to navigate, you have a higher probability of uh, colliding. OK, so what we mean by high level insights and what is a rule template? So essentially, we want to capture this high level insight using some formal representation, and in particular, is the first order logic. And the idea is that at an example of an uh, uh, expert inside is uh, the robot should move at high speed only if it is reasonably sure that the segment is easy to navigate. This is uh, a very reasonable insight, and uh, it's quite easy to actually write uh, um, a, a rule template, such as the one that you see here, that says select as fast, so go fast, when the probability of the segment uh, <coughs> being clear is higher than a given amount, or um, the probability of the segment being he heavily cluttered okay, is lower than a given amount. Okay? But uh, it's very difficult to say what is the value of x1 and what is the value of x2. The expert can also give uh, some thresholds. So for example, can say, I want the probability of being clear to be higher than 80%. Okay, uh, but this doesn't. This is not an equal sign. So you're not assigning a value to x1. You're just saying, uh, I think that x1 should meet this constraint, and this is considered a hard requirement for us. Okay, so the idea is uh, for the expert uh, is easy to um, describe a reasonable rule template that has an uh, uninstantiated variable, in particular x1 and x2. The hard part is uh, to find values for x1 and x2, the hard part for the operator, is to find values for x1 and x2 that uh, correctly describe the policy that POMCP is using. Okay? So to do this, uh, to, so to instantiate the rule template, uh, what we do is we analyze traces and run what is uh, a max SMT, so a uh, satisfiability modulo theory. So we try to find a model that maximizes the number of uh, um, um, 
instantiated rules that are not violated. And for this, we use a, a standard uh, solver, uh, which is Z3, which are quite a uh, uh, well-known solver. So after we do this, uh, these rules are then instantiated, and this is what we call the uh, rule synthesis. So now we have a rule where X1 and X2, or in general, the free variable are instantiated. And then we can use uh, this rule to actually perform the outlay, outlayer analysis. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, uh, what I just described. So we instantiate the root template based on traces. The trace has typically this form. So you have uh, essentially a belief. Uh, it's uh, the probability of the difficulty of the segment, in our case, that relates to an action. And this is, a, um, is not a policy, it's a, it's a trace. It's an execution trace uh, that you uh, obtain from the agent. Then based on the template and on the trace, uh, we instantiate the rule using the uh, max, uh, solving essentially a max SMT uh, that will never violate the hard constraint and will uh, um, satisfy most of the clauses, as, as many as possible. So in this case, essentially what we're doing is we are combining the traces and the expert insights to then summarize the policy that is never explicitly represented for POM CP. Okay, so this is the, the important part. Then, once you have uh, these rules uh, that now are instantiated, so you have uh, values for every for the three variables, you can uh, find unexpected decision by identifying actions that are far away from the rule. So we compare uh, unsatisfiable steps and points inside the rule with a, a specific distance, which is a Hellinger distance between the two beliefs. And then we identify outlier based on a threshold. Okay, so essentially we take um, a, a rule that we have. If the rule uh, does not match with the action that the actual that the robot actually performed, then what we do is uh, we build um, points that actually satisfy the rules, and we evaluate how distant is. Um, the, 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 the current uh, belief with respect to the belief of these points. If this distance is higher than a threshold, we consider this uh, specific instance to be an unexpected decision, okay? Because you can have several instances that are more or less close to the rule, okay? But what you really care about is out, are outlayers, so decisions that are clearly out of the expert insight. Okay. Also, you can refine the, te the, the template if you find out that your rule can, does not correctly describe uh, your situation. And for example, in this case, there is a short segment, okay? And the robot, in this case, uh, took a slow action, even if it was actually convinced that the segment was clear, okay? So this does not respect the rule. But the reason why the robot took this action is that this um, segment is very short, and so for the POM CP, it was not worth to um, uh, go faster <clears throat> in this particular part of the environment, okay? So in this case, you can then go back to the rule template and change the rule template to take into account this point. Okay, so very briefly for the result, what we did is uh, we injected error into the POM CP. And the interesting thing is that uh, we injected errors which are difficult to, to, to find out because essentially we use the wrong parameterization of POMCP. POMCP has various parameters. And if you change one of these parameters in a, in a wrong way, it's very difficult to check because the algorithm is working, but sometimes it's taking a wrong decision. And this actually came from the fact that when we were using POMCP, we actually did this mistake and it was very difficult for us to find out. So we decided to inject this error uh, using different parameters, in particular, um, the parameter uh, that we use is the reward range that you have to specify. And this gives a different percentage of error. Now, what you see here, without going too much into the detail, is that uh, we compared our approach with a standard uh, anomaly detection approach, isolation forest. And what you can see is that the area under the curve, um, and under the um, ROC curve, and the average precision stays high in our case, even when the injected error grows, while it goes down for the isolation forest. Okay, this is uh, referred to the a, a different domain, which is Tiger, is the famous PomDP uh, uh, 
problem uh, related to Tiger, uh, where you have to decide which door to open. Um, we decided to use this one because in this case, you can actually evaluate the error because you can define an optimal policy. Uh, for velocity regulation, it's difficult to find the optimal policy. More results for velocity regulation are in the paper if, if you're interested. Okay, so this concludes the part uh, for uh, the more technical part of the talk. So very briefly, I will go through current and future uh, research directions that we are doing. So the first one refers to shielding, which is related to what we just discussed. And the idea is to use the unexpected actions, uh, the unexpected decision that we the, that we identified with the description that I gave you before to actually block them and uh, make sure that uh, only accepted action are actually executed while the POMCP cp is, a, is, a, is actually choosing the, its action. And we already uh, have some results uh, on this. This is actually, uh, they are inside, um, again, this is uh, together with Giulio Mazzi and Alberto Castellini. And this is a paper accepted at ICAPS where we show that essentially if you shield the POMCP, cp you achieve better, result, better returns, so higher returns. If you're interested into this, we can discuss more, but for now, this is um, our current research direction. And uh, what we are working on is to combine more deeply the learning part of the rule with respect to the POM CP execution. So not work on traces, but work while the POM CP <coughs> is executing the actions. Um, then, uh, Multi-robot coordination is, of course, a very important uh, um, uh, topic in general and a topic I, I worked for uh, in, in the last years. Uh, personally, I think that for multi-robot coordination, multi-agent pickup and delivery and multi-agent pathfinding, which, is, which are the problems that we've seen before, are very interesting. And uh, within this space, what we are uh, working on is essentially um, to try and see if you can actually use uh, deep reinforcement learning approaches, um, also to, um, to have agents that uh, find a multi-agent path, so to coordinate and finding a, a conflict-free path that avoid collisions. The last part is for behavioral anomaly uh, for robots. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, a very interesting uh, perspective, and uh, I think it's very well uh, described by this picture here that, again, is related to the InCatch project. So what you can see here is a planned path for the robot. Okay, just consider the green part, the last part here. And this is the one that actually the robot executed. As you can see, whenever the robot was going from uh, north to south, it, it was actually deviating a little bit to the, uh, to the west. And uh, we still didn't understand exactly why this was happening. It's uh, not an obvious mistake. Um, the most important thing is that this is a mistake that you see only when you look at the overall behavior. So it's not uh, a failure if one, in one of the components of the system. It's a problem of the behavior. And so I think a very interesting uh, direction is to actually explore data analysis tool uh, that can highlight behavioral anomaly for robots rather than single failures. And we are doing uh, several uh, uh, research in this area, but I think since we are uh, uh, short on time, I would uh, stop here. If you're interested, we can discuss this more. And I would like to uh, finish by uh, with a thank you to you for uh, listening to the talk and also to all the group of people that participated uh, into the different work. I mentioned some of them. Here you can find uh, all the people that are um, that I usually collaborate with and that I would like to thank uh, because without them, it would not be possible to do all this uh, nice research. Okay, thank you very much. I'm done and uh, I don't know how you want to proceed. Uh, we can take questions. Uh, uh, can people who have questions either mention that in the chat or maybe, I don't know, use the hand feature or something. Um, I'm going to again use my uh, limited superpowers <laughs> to ask Sandro a couple of questions. Is that okay, Sandro? Yeah, yeah sure. While we wait. Yeah, okay. So uh, if you can go back to that thing where you had with the R, uh, you can even speak as it is. Like, you know, the one where you're talking about the explainability with the POM CP stuff. You know, you had this nice block diagram where you had the traces and then I forgot, um, I did not. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yes. One? Yeah. So, yeah. So this, uh, 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 since the, I mean, the traces, I believe just first clarification are needed because you can't, you don't have the policy stored, right? So the traces are a way of getting sort of uh, 
the observations and actions and so on correct exactly um, yes okay so uh, my question is twofold like one first one is this this notion of um, outlier analysis and this rule synthesis right how, how do you how do you i mean these have to be to detect that something is an outlier you have to somehow formulate some rules first right so can you talk a bit about what kind of rules does it have to begin with and then uh, what what because um, if something is an outlier not just be, uh, is it just based on data even then you have to provide some basic ground rules to say what constitutes an outlier and given these initial set of rules what then do you actually learn or detect can you talk a bit about that yes so that, that's a very good question so essentially the idea is that uh, um, the rule template provides um, um, as a, is, is not a specific uh, ground rule on which you 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 then find out the outlier, but uh, is a, a general uh, template on how a rule should look like. So for example, in this case, uh, when, you, when you see this template, okay, what you are saying is you are providing some information because you are saying that uh, to go fast, the robot should be reason should have a um, probability should know that the segment has a probability of being clear higher than a given amount or it should have the probability that the same uh, segment is cluttered lower than a given amount but you don't have uh, an intuition of how these two numbers should be uh, inserted so if we forget about this part of the rule for a second i will go back to this later so if you don't put this essentially what you're doing is uh, you are <clears throat> trusting somehow that the system is doing the correct thing overall in general and so you specify into x1 and x2 you will instantiate x1 and x2 with the um, numbers that uh, satisfy most uh, of the situations when the robot actually sees so, uh, so if i understand this correctly the general uh, for um, let me try if i can post this so the general format of the rules uh, so to speak the structure of the rules and the mm -hmm. parameters in the rules are provided by the designer but the values of the parameters are set based on the analysis of the traces that you get in runtime exactly yes am, am i getting this correctly yes so this okay. is uh, the, the the general uh, template is written by the system designer X1 and X2 in this case will be filled in by the analysis. Oh, so of the can, can you can you then have a lag based efforts? Oh, no, sorry, I should be more precise. So can you then have instances where, say, as the traces come in, if you're not careful, you could sort of get values assigned to this that are initially not correct or based on some local 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 phenomena. Can that happen? It can happen, uh, but uh, in in the in this uh, analysis that I described, uh, you don't. Uh, uh, you don't have a concept of building the rule as you go because you you oh, batch go. processing okay okay exactly it's post processing so you look at all the traces so of course if you have a few um, instances you can have uh, that so you need to have uh, enough uh, um, instances of uh, in, in enough steps in the traces so enough couples of belief and actions. I see, Andy. So, but still, the symbols and the format of the rules are uh, will have to be provided by the someone who has domain knowledge. Correct? That's yes. where the expert comes in. Yes, 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 yes. So the rules okay. are not uh, written by the system. The rule is written by the system designer, mm -hmm. and then the system fills in the the value of the free variables essentially. Okay, and the unexpected decisions then just to follow through is where, say, during runtime, the uh, you you see some exceptions to the rules that you had. Uh, exactly, yes, but actually the, the subfield thing is that uh, since you try to, uh, since you fill these values, uh, x1 and x2 in this example, mm -hmm. uh, with, with the ones that uh, uh, satisfy most of the, of the, of the sample of the rule, yeah. mm -hmm. then even the same traces that you, uh, you don't have, you don't need to have another traces, even the, for the same traces you can find uh, outliers, because there will be... Correct, correct. I mean, you, you are sort of doing this with some, some sort of majority rule, so there will still be some exactly. instances where they don't satisfy this. Okay. Exactly. And is there is there some way to, I'm sorry, since no one else is asking a question, is there some sense of drifting happening? Like, you know, over time, say you learned this, but then sort of, uh, uh, you're saying you're not learning it uh, incrementally, but let's say I learned on a batch, I set these rules, now I find that it's not working. Is there a way to identify that and fix it? Do you do anything like that? 
So this is a sort of uh, um, somehow related to this uh, second part, uh, this where x1 mm -hmm. is higher than 0 0.8, because this uh, uh, gives you a way of uh, sort of what you were saying before, gives you a way of grounding. So if you mm -hmm. say it, it's not possible, I don't think that the robot should ever make this decision if it's not certain more than 80% that the segment is clear, okay? Then uh, you will, uh, 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 let's say, avoid the, the drifting that you're saying, because uh, you, you avoid that just by majority, you fill in the rule in a wrong way. I don't know okay. if this okay. answers your question. Cool. Really cool. Because these are hard requirements, so this mm -hmm. cannot, uh, uh, you, you will not consider a rule to be satisfied if this is not true. Mm. And then uh, after that, you, you do the majority that you were talking about. Okay, so I, I'll take a short break. I have questions, but I don't want to. Man, I can always <laughs> talk to you. Let's see if someone else asks any questions. Any questions for the speaker, please? Um, I would have a question. Uh, Martin, go ahead. Um, yes, it's. Uh, I think it was on slide uh, 17 that was um, sort of the main condition formula for the safety. Uh, we should be, no, sorry. This one? Um, yes, th that one. Um, and I was wondering, uh, the, the inputs uh, x0 to xn, uh, like for a, a neural network that is uh, trained in deep reinforcement learning, that would include uh, the, the observed states, I assume? That, exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, so I guess it can be very high dimensional. Um, so the rules as they are written there would be with where each state is actually independent from each other. Um, so this is uh, um, to clarify when, because when you say state, uh, um, this is actually the input uh, for the network. So for example, if we consider a uh, mapless navigation task, typically the input of the network are the scans of the laser and where the position uh, of the final target should be. Uh, yeah, let's say this, okay. Then you will have, if you consider, I don't know, uh, 200 scans for the laser, you will have 200 inputs. It is not the state, it's the input, uh, it's the observation, if you want. Yes, okay. But, so but these observations will probably be not, not really independent from each other. So say if X0 is in the interval from a, A0 to B0, then that might have some effect on uh, Xn potentially? Yes, 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 yes. That's true, yeah. Can so that be modeled as well? Or would it be just uh, like uh, yeah, more the, rules of this kind? So at, at the moment, uh, it's um, you need to um, address this by a careful uh, writing of the rules. So there is no, no way of uh, handling this uh, uh, automatically from the system. So you, you need to realize that uh, if you're talking, for example, of a laser scan and you're looking at two scans that are very close one to each other, it's highly likely that if one is uh, in a given range, the other one will be in a given range as well. So typically what we do, we typically downsample the scans and uh, so you have less dependency between them. But of course, it's a, it's a trade-off. So you, you, you need to carefully write the rules uh, in a way that uh, you are aware of this dependency or you avoid that uh, with the network configuration. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, while we are on this slide, uh, Sandra, I have one quick, hopefully, question for you. So, so uh, when, you, when you have these uh, property definitions, right, I believe, I think you confirmed that too right now, that these are defined by the designer, right, like the input-output uh, constraints for the uh, things like this, right? So, yes. Uh, so I had, um, I, I was curious, so can you do something because we have done something similar to, I mean, not with the same kind of uh, problems that you're looking at, but uh, can you can you not take uh, some of the uh, strategies you have later with POM CP stuff and somehow analyze samples and try to figure out some of these rules with these kind of networks as well, because that would be interesting to see. Um, yes. So. The, the thing is that you, this is a very interesting uh, uh, point. And in fact, there are some uh, work uh, that uh, essentially do more or less uh, what uh, I was uh, discussing about the shielding. 
but instead of POMC P, they they use a neural network as a as an analyzer to uh, analyze yes, a yes, neural yeah. network. Yeah, and I think I think especially the strategy you described later, right? That I think that would be, I mean, with some tweaks, of course, not directly, would would be useful here because we, I mean, with some students, I've I've, I've done this thing of trying to learn these uh, behavioral uh, rules describing behavior of a robot from the uh, mm -hmm. uh, where the initial decision internal decision making is based on deep networks. So I was curious if you have uh, explored any of that. No, we, we, we didn't. We didn't explore this uh, yet, I would say, in the sense that it's, a, it's clearly a very interesting uh, direction. And in fact, um, well, when, when we discussed uh, with, uh, often with, uh, with Davide, that is the main author of this, we, we reached the conclusion that uh, to some extent, uh, if you can specify good rules, uh, you almost uh, solve the problem because the, the hardest part is actually how you specify rules which are useful. So that's why in the later on here I showed you these uh, properties, mm -hmm. which are much easier to uh, to write down, but that can give you uh, a good uh, correlation between violation rate and collision. The Correct. point is that uh, if you manage to write a rule that captures all the input configuration that creates a violation, you already know a lot about the system to some mm -hmm. extent. So I think that learning this rule or have finding a way to actually uh, have a, a rule template or something like that would be really, really useful. But still, we up to now, we didn't do anything in that direction. So okay, cool. Okay. It'd be really interesting. Anybody else with questions? Okay, so I think then we should first uh, thank the speaker. Uh, uh, for taking time to do this talk. Um, uh, always nice to hear from you, uh, Alessandro. And I think since I'm, I'm a mic on, I will do my clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very and much. Thanks to you and like, you know, your uh, collaborators who also joined this talk, right? Uh, uh, this is interesting work. Uh, I think there are some, I have some other questions, but I will probably hold and I will, I may send you an email with some other things later on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That would be really interesting. And of course, we are more than uh, happy to uh, collaborate on any of these uh, or go, go deeper into the understanding of okay. any of these okay. arguments. No, like I, I have had some papers on this uh, with some students on the, um, especially with the robot uh, behavior and sort of trying to have some basic rules written for reasoning. And then uh, wherever learning happens to try and get the behavioral equivalents in terms of rules and stuff. So and both in terms of normal figuring out what's going on there and also to in terms of the explainability part. So I am interested in what you're talking about here. And that is why we actually invited you. Oh, no, I'm being recorded. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. I'm, I'm happy I, I picked the right argument. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Andrew. Thanks for your time. Well, yeah. I'm happy to continue this uh, offline, and uh, thank you very much to everyone for uh, yes. for for having me here. Okay. Yes.